Okay, hello. Uh, lecturing via Zoom today. Um, although so far no one has joined the Zoom meeting either. So I'm lecturing to myself, but uh, hopefully um, people will work off the recording on YouTube when I put it up. Um, okay, so uh, as usual, I'm gonna start by saying where we are in the book. Everything we're reading in this course is from the Doctrine of Elements, which is why I've stopped writing Doctrine of Elements at the beginning. There's also another part called the Doctrine of the Method that we're not going to get to. Um, the Doctrine of Elements, Doctrine of Elements is much longer than the Doctrine of the Method. Uh, um, so this is most of the book. And uh, most of the doctrine of elements is the transcendental logic. Transcendental aesthetic, we finished talking about in the first two lectures. So the transcendental logic, transcendental logic has two parts, the analytic and the dialectic. And dialectic has three parts. Well, I said dialectic has two parts. concepts of pure reason the dialectical inferences of pure reason I'm just going to write inferences and then the inferences has three parts the paralogisms antinomy and the last part which we're starting today the ideal So um, just to review um, what's going on here, um, in a judgment, so a judgment has a rule and it has a condition on which the rule is applied. And the condition supplies unity um, to a synthesis, a synthesis of the imagination um, in a way that allows the understanding to think uh, all the manifold, I wanna say manifold things, although thing isn't, a good word to use here, but that's why Kant just talks about the manifold, but all that is manifold in that synthesis allows the understanding to think all that is manifold in that synthesis under a single rule. Thus uniting many cognitions into one. Right, so in the easy example of a categorical affirmative, uh, sorry, a uh, universal categorical affirmative assertoric judgment, like all cinnabar is red. So the condition is the rule of the subject concept. In this case, that would be cinnabar. There's something manifold in my intuition, um, which the imagination can put together or synthesize, right? Synthesize just means put together. So there's something manifold in my sensations, which the imagination can put together in such a way as to allow it to all be thought under a single rule. 
And in the, in the simple case of this universal judgment, the way that's working is that I'm thinking of that whole manifold as all the same thing, right? So the concept of reflection that's involved here is identity, sameness. I'm thinking of it as all the same thing, as all one. Um, and then that's what allows in the judgment for me to think something about this manifold um, all at once using the rule of the predicate concept red, right? So instead of saying, thinking this sensation is from, comes from something red and this comes from something red, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I just think them all together through the rule cinnabar and I apply red to all of them together. So that's a judgment. And then the way I try to explain a syllogism, um, according to Kant, is that um, in a syllogism, reason gives a different kind of unity to the same manifolds that the understanding unifies in judgments. So, um, the kind of unity it tries to give it is the unity of explanation. Right, so what we want to do is to explain why um, everything to which this condition applies falls under this rule. In the judgment, all I do is assert that. In the syllogism, I'm gonna explain that and I'm going to explain that by means of a higher condition. And basically it works something like this. Like I, um, I already know this is the major premise of the syllogism that the predicate concept applies on this higher condition then the minor premise um, brings the subject of the conclusion under that condition. And therefore the conclusion is able to join the subject to the predicate with an explanation in terms of the condition, right? So if I say like, for example, um, all scholars are mortal, a scholar means like a learned person, right? So all scholars are mortal. Um, that's just an assertion, right? All the manifold of sensations I get from scholars um, can be brought together under this one rule, scholar. And on the condition that something falls under that rule, I can apply the predicate concept mortal. The explanation, uh, of at least of one kind, the explanation given in a categorical syllogism might be something like, um, all humans are mortal, all scholars are human, therefore all scholars are mortal. So the major premise right now, this is mortal. This is scholar. This is human. The major premise brings the condition, the higher condition under the predicate, all humans are mortal. The minor premise brings the subject that we're trying to conclude about, scholar, under the condition, all scholars are human. And the, con the conclusion therefore is able to, to think all scholars as mortal with an explanation. The reason they're all mortal is they're all human. Okay, and um, reason demands that if the condition is given, the whole series of conditions be given. That is, reason de demands a complete explanation of all the unities that are asserted by the understanding and judgments. The unity asserted by the understanding must be explicable. 
That's the demand of reason. And the illusion, the transcendental illusion, is that we take that demand of reason to be objective, to somehow be claiming something about the object of every judgment. No matter what the object is, so now we're considering the object transcendentally, that is just with respect to the properties it has as an object as such. No matter what the object is, um, we think that something about it, something about the object considered transcendentally must guarantee that the complete series of conditions is given. Okay, so um, like I said, that's just the background of how we got here. Now, there's one other thing to say that um, um, there's three ways three ways a higher condition can establish a conclusion. And they have to do with the three types of major premise of the syllogism, right? If the major premise of the syllogism is a categorical judgment, then we get a categorical syllogism like the one I just gave. If it's a hypothetical judgment, if uh, C is D, then A is B, then we get a hypothetical syllogism. And if it's a disjunctive judgment, either A is B or C is D, but not both, then we get a disjunctive syllogism. Um, and the way I tried to explain those three types of relation and therefore those three types of syllogism is that the categorical, the condition in the categorical judgment is supposed to be something internal to the subject. Like in this case, that it's the scholars that are human. That's the explanation. It's something about them that explains why they're mortal. Whereas in a hypothetical judgment, the condition that explains uh, why the rule apl applies to the subject is something external to the subject. Right, so if it's... Uh, uh, a hypothetical syllogism gives an external explanation, something that's not part of the um, concept of the subject. Sorry, that's not part of the subject, right? We're not talking about what's part of the concept of the subject. We're talking about what's part of its object, right? So um, like, uh, it may not be part of the definition of scholar that they're human. But it may be, in fact, that all the scholars, at least as far as we know, are human, right? So that's something internal to the subject of the judgment, even though it's not part of the con subject concept. So similarly here, external, we mean something that's external to the subject of the judgment. Um, I had a usual trouble giving a good example of this. The, the example Kant gives uh, of a hypothetical judgment if perfect justice exists, the obstinately wicked will be punished. I mean, I guess that's a good example, right? So like perfect justice existing is not somehow contained in the obstinately wicked. It's not something about them. It's something about the world external to them. If perfect justice exists, then the obstinately wicked will be punished. So, right, so in this picture, and like the reason, well, no, let me get into that, but so like, the subject is the obstinately wicked, Frankit is punished. Right, so the major premise in this case is if perfect justice exists, this is a judgment. I mean, I say if 
the world is perfectly just. You can see what the subject of this judgment is. If the world is perfectly just, then the obstinately wicked will be punished. That's the major premise. The minor premise is um, brings the actual state of affairs under the condition of the major premise. The actual state of affairs is such that the world is perfectly just, and therefore we have an explanation for why the obstinately wicked will be punished. I don't know if that was helpful or not. Um, what this is leading up to, of course, is so that first type of explanation was the one that reason was demanding an unconditioned version of in the paralogisms. The second, the external type, was the kind reason was demanding an unconditioned version of in the antinomy. In the ideal, we're looking for an unconditioned version of the type of explanation we get in a disjunctive judgment. So, um, sorry, in a disjunctive syllogism, the major premise of which is a disjunctive judgment. Um, So the way I tried to explain what a disjunctive judgment is like, and therefore what a disjunctive syllogism does before is to say, like, again, as I was just doing in the case of hypothetical, the hypothetical judgment, you kind of have to think of the actual state of affairs is what you're talking about here. You're, and you're asking like whether a certain judgment is true in the actual state of affairs. And You do it by like um, first assuming a concept that covers all the possibilities in this situation. Yeah, I mean, that concept uh, won't appear in the syllogism itself. Um, because the way the syllogism works is by taking a division of the sphere of that concept. So this concept is states of affairs we need to consider in this situation or something like that. And we start by dividing it into pieces. And each one, well, so I should draw these outside the circle. I think that's how I did it before. So the thing is like um, intrinsic to the subject we're talking about is just this total possibility of how it could be. But um, we um, divide it up into cases based on external conditions. So I'm trying to explain how a disjunctive judgment is like a combination of a categorical judgment and a hypothetical judgment. It basically works by saying like, if external condition one, then the actual state of affairs is in this. If, right, so these are hypothetical judgments. If external condition two, then the actual state of affairs is in here. If external condition three, then the actual state of affairs is in here. But then we add the actual state of affairs is somewhere in this. That's the part that's like a categorical judgment. And we know that is, that's what the judgment um, asserts, that we've got these three external conditions among them divide up this whole circle. There's nothing left over. That's what the disjunctive judgment says. So the disjunctive judgment says these three external conditions add up to the internal condition, to the complete characterization of 
the possibility under which the actual state of affairs falls. Now, in, this, in a disjunctive syllogism, the major premise will be like this. And then the minor premise will rule out um, all of these divisions except one. Right, so like the minor premise itself will be disjunctive if there's more than two disjuncts in the major premise, um, right? So we'll say something like not E is F or C is V. It will be disjunctive and negative. But anyway, leaving aside the question of what that minor premise is like, the minor premise rules out all of these divisions except one. And then using the major premise, which tells us that there's no other place left for the actual state of affairs to be in, we reach the conclusion that it's in here. And since it's in here, it's in the place where A equals B. A is B, right? Well, so the conclusion is A is B. So the major premise will look like either A is B or E is F or C is V. The minor premise will look like, but not E is F or C is D. And the conclusion will be, therefore, A is B. So, um, so the kind of explanation that's offered by the disjunctive syllogism um, um, well, let me actually, I was going to read where Kant says this about how the disjunctive syllogism works. Um, oops. This is on B604. And it's page 491 in the Kemp Smith translation. Um, The logical determination of a concept by reason is based upon a disjunctive syllogism in which the major premise contains a logical division, the division of the sphere of a universal concept, right? That's my big circle. As I said, that universal concept that's being divided doesn't actually appear in the syllogism. It's not one of the terms of the syllogism, but it's there because it's the it's the field that's being divided by the major premise. The minor premise limiting this sphere to a certain part and the conclusion determining the concept by means of this part. Um, that's how a disjunctive syllogism works. Not, not. So the kind of explanation that it's giving for the unity of the understanding in a judgment, right? So now, I don't know what A and B are. Again, I'm oh, sorry, this would be A. Then Kant's example is kind of weird of a disjunctive judgment, right? Like. Uh, either the world exists by chance or by design or by blind necessity or something like that. Um, but anyway, th this is the conclusion of the syllogism. Like as in every syllogism, according to Kant, the syllogism is really a judgment. Which judgment is it really? The conclusion, right? The syllogism really is stating the conclusion, but with an explanation, right? So, the syllogism like asserts that A is B, but with the kind of explanation, and now it's with the kind of explanation that we give in a disjunctive syllogism. And the explanation is 
in terms of a common ground that underlies all the alternatives, in the sense that each one of the alternatives is allowed because it's one of the possibilities of that common ground. It's allowed by the internal nature of that ground. And the explanation says, um, the reason the rule must apply on this condition is that um, um, the rule applying on this condition is one of the alternatives that the internal nature of the common ground makes possible. And the Meyer premise has ruled out the other alternatives. So it's an explanation by limitation of a common ground of possibility. Um, so, I mean, notice that the unity of reason here is the unity that's, that's supplied to this actual judgment, right? Whatever this judgment is, um, it's this explanation is a unified explanation of why this rule applies on this condition, right? It says every place this condition holds, this rule has to apply because common ground, blah, blah, blah. But so, um, so this is the unity that's being established by reason in this case, the unity of explanation of this relationship here. But it's establishing that on the basis of a kind of higher unity. Um, I mean, although this higher unity itself is not a unity of reason, but of the understanding, it's a universal concept, right? But it's saying, like, um, the, the, the way we get a unified explanation of this is by treating this as one alternative out of many that are established on a single common ground of possibility. So the ideal um, that is the part of the dialectical illusion that is based on uh, demanding an unconditional disjunctive explanation um, is looking for an unconditioned and universal explanation of this kind in the object meaning that the unity in any empirical judgment, that is the unity in any judgment that's asserted about an empirical object, um, should be derivable from a single common ground whose internal condition is the sum of all these judgments all possible judgments add up to this one sum of all possibility um, in the sense that each one of them is possible only because of this common ground that they all have and um, taken together, they exhaust it, right? That is, it doesn't make any other things possible. So, um, um, this explains the particular way that a transcendent object comes in in the case of this part of the diet of the transcendental illusion the um the unity that's going to be explained here is i mean like as it was in the paralogisms and the antinomy the unity that's going to be explained here is the unity of empirical judgments right we're asking for an unconditioned explanation that will um that will supply the whole series of conditions to explain every individual empirical judgment um but 
Um, um, in the case of the ideal, um, it does that by appealing to a broader unity, which isn't limited to empirical judgments. Right? It says, like, what would be an unconditioned explanation of this kind for this judgment? Well, I say all possible judgments have a common ground of possibility. Um, when you rule out all the others, at least that is all the others that are inconsistent with this one, right? So you rule out all the others, um, only this one is left. So again, we would have an explanation by the limitation of a common ground of possibility. But in this case, the common ground of possibility encompasses all possible judgments. So um, it's, it's self unconditioned. We don't need a further explanation for it of this kind. Um, and um, um, so the dialectical illusion says, we must have a concept of that unconditioned unity of all possibilities. And like, remember, that's how when Kant went through the three parts, uh, the three t parts of the transcendental illusion, or that is the three um, parts of the dialectical inferences of reason, um, he said, you know, the three relations here are the relation to the subject, the relation of the object to the world, and the relation of the object to all possible things in general. That's the one we're talking about here, the relationship of the object to all possible things in general. So the universal ground of all possibility, I mean, I've been saying it makes all judgments possible, but like, um, um, is this already part of the illusion? I guess in a way it is, right? Like as, as I said um, to begin with, like a week or two ago, when we started talking about the dialectic, um, you know, when when under the influence of the transcendental uh, illusion, we look for an explanation in the object. Um, in a sense, that's like, there is no object because reason doesn't apply to objects. Reason applies to judgments of the understanding. Um, so, but the transcendental illusion says, well, okay, but we have to have an object somewhere. And therefore we look to the object of the judgment. That is, in the case of a categorical judgment, the object of the subject concept of the judgment. We look for the explanation there. And so, um, so like, um, when we're trying to represent this ground of all possibility in the object, we're representing it as the ground of the possibility of all possible subjects of judgment. That is, of all possible things that you could affirm or negate something of. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the next nature of the illusion here. Now, um, there's a question. I mean, if there was anyone here, first of all, I would pause to ask if people had questions about that because I'm sure it wasn't very clear, but... Um, uh, there's no one here, so I can't pause for questions. All right. Um, so let me, I'm going to regret erasing whatever I erase, but I'll read, I can erase this. This is the safest thing here. All right. We'll need some room. So, um, so the question, however, is like, um, and I think this is, there's several things that makes the that make the ideal harder than the first two parts of the dialectic. I mean, 
there's actually some things that make the ideal easier than the other two parts of the dialectic, but there's several things that make it harder than the uh, other two parts of the dialectic. The first is what I basically already went into, namely how complicated disjunctive judgment is, and therefore how complicated a disjunctive syllogism is. Like it's hard to keep all the pieces together in the right order, and I'm not even sure I'm succeeding. <laughs> um, but uh, another thing that makes the ideal difficult is that Kant doesn't mark off very clearly which things he's saying are things he really thinks are true and which things he's saying from the point of view of having already gone off on the illusion, right? The transition is not very clear. Um, we'll see that that's like, continues to be the case when I talk about the proofs of the existence of God next week. It's not clear, I think, that the illusion happens before we try to prove the existence of God. They're already off on the transcendental illusion. And that then the step, the further step of trying to prove that this object exists involves some further errors. Um, and I think Kant says that in today's reading already. But I have to admit, he's not completely clear. If someone wanted to say everything about this is right, except the attempt to prove that the object that we're talking about exists, um, I mean, I I think I could try to, to show from the text that that's not the case, but I would have to admit that it's not absolutely clear, right? On the other hand, um, it's not clear that the transcendental illusion doesn't happen way, way back. And I'm more inclined to think that, that um, the very first step of saying something like, um, consider all the possible judgments is already under the influence of the transcendental illusion. Um, And so, like, for example, this is on B601 on page 489. Um, switch to this again. What the proposition therefore asserts is this. Now, which proposition we're talking about here is not 100% clear actually, but anyway, there's a proposition and what asserts is this, that to know a thing completely, we must know every possible, Kemp Smith has filled in predicate. Hmm. That's probably right, but I have to, I'm going to have to look at the original to see if I agree. Anyway, we must know every possible predicate and must determine it thereby. That is, must determine what? The thing, right? To know a thing completely, we must know every possible predicate and must determine the thing thereby, either affirmatively or negatively. So like in context, it's again, not entirely clear. You might think that Kant is agreeing with this, right? Saying like, okay, so here's the issue. In order to know a thing completely, we would have to know every possible predicate. But I think that's not what's going on. I think this is part of the illusion. Um, it's already a mistake to think that to know a thing completely, we must know every possible predicate and then like determine whether it applies to the thing we're thinking about or not. Um,
because the empirical state of affairs, right? Like the actual state of things that, that we're trying to locate in some circle, the empirical state of affairs um, um, the sum total of alternatives that it's uh, known to exclude is itself only known empirically. That is a posteriori. That is like, we only know what alternative predicates they are if we've experienced them. Nevertheless, the actual state of things is completely determined. Um, but it's completely determined as a mode of extension that is of space as the form of external sense. So it's like, um, um, every object has to be somewhere at this time. All the and we know all the other alternatives that are excluded. Um, um, and that's not because we have a concept that. Um, of every possible state of affairs in space. And we know the actual one by limiting that concept. It's because space is um, um, a single condition on which any external object can be intuited, that is, can affect us. Um, so, um, um it's hard to say right and it would be impossible to draw a picture of which i'm attempted to try to do but um this is exactly where drawing a picture will will not work it's that um, that form of external sense, um, well, I mean, like, at least I can draw one picture, you know, our old friend, the Digon, the polygon with two straight sides, um, is like the impossibility of this is um, um, part of the form of external sense. And it's the part of external sense that uh, makes it the case that um, exactly one alternative must be true out of infinitely many alternatives. Namely, that, you know, if I'm here and there's an object here, it must be in exactly one direction. So if it lies in this direction, it doesn't lie in this direction because if it, it was in both directions at the same time, there would be two straight lines from me to it, and that's impossible. So, um, so from the fact that it affects me, I know that it's affected me from one precise direction and not any of the others. Um, and that's the case, even though, um, it doesn't belong to the concept of 
a direction, that it excludes the alternatives, which is another way of saying that, um, as, Kant said, as Kant gave us his example such a long time ago now, right? The proposition that there's exactly one straight line between any two points is not analytic. It doesn't belong to the concept of a straight line that there isn't also another different straight line from the to this object. Um, so it's not something I can prove from a universal concept, um, which I can then divide up to give all the alternate possibilities. Um, it's something that... Uh, doesn't come from the understanding at all. It comes from the form of sensibility. I feel like what I just said is not very satisfactory. And if there were actually people here now, they would not be looking happy, but... Um, that's the best I can do for the moment. And I'm, so I'm gonna go on and talk about something else. Um, so um, another thing that makes a, ideal more difficult than the other two parts is that um, it doesn't contain an example syllogism, um, let alone four different example syllogisms, like there are in the A edition of the paralogisms, like one for each category. Um, there's no syllogism at all. There's a kind of suggestion about what the syllogism might be. Um, this is on the bottom of B599. Uh, it's on 488 in the translation. Um, Everything as regards its possibility is likewise subject to the principle of complete determination, according to which, if all possible predicates of things be taken together with their contrary op contradictory opposites, then one of each pair of contradictory opposites must belong to it. So I'm going to talk in more detail about what's being said here um, in a moment, but just in terms of um, um, how you could get a syllogism out of this. It would go something like, this would be the major premise. Everything as regards its possibility is subject to the principle of complete determination, etc. Then the minor premise would be something like, but the object of experience is a thing. And then the conclusion would be, therefore the object of experience is subject to the principle of complete determination, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, I mean, there would be a dialectical syllogism. Uh, um, Kant doesn't actually write out that syllogism and this, that syllogism, I mean, so remember, in the paralogism, in the paralogisms, the uh, dialectical syllogism was a categorical syllogism. In the antinomy, the example Kant gave of a dialectical syllogism was a hypothetical syllogism. So here we might expect a disjunctive syllogism, um, but the one I just gave was categorical, not disjunctive. So does that mean that's not the right one? We should look for a disjunctive one. I'm not sure what the disjunctive one would be. 
anyway, it was hard to explain that pattern. So maybe it doesn't hold here. I don't know, right? It was hard to explain that pattern. Well, I won't go through the whole thing again, but basically because like um, these dialectical inferences are not the actual syllogism by which we're trying to explain the object of experience. They're going in the other direction, right? So like we're trying to explain the object of experience by in principle, an infinite number of syllogisms or whatever of, of each kind. Um, um, those sil imaginary syllogisms would go down from the unconditioned to the object of experience. But here, the dialectical syllogisms are going in one step in the other direction, right? From the object of experience to the unconditioned transcendent object. Um, so why they should have the same type of major premise as the syllogisms we're trying to guarantee will, will work is not so clear. In any case, so like, I, um, I don't know what the dialectical inference here is supposed to look like if you were to write it out as a syllogism. Um, okay, so that's another thing that's kind of unsatisfactory. I just know what to say about it. But now here's some things that I do know something what to say about. Um, so, okay, so the... Um, So the connection in the object, right? So like, again, reason or like reason is directing the understanding to look for some unconditioned guarantee in the object that any given judgment I reach will have a complete series of explanations. Um, so, uh, in the case of the paralogisms, it was looking for an absolute subject of which all experiences are just modes. And for reasons I tried to explain, but not very well, that subject ends up being like the soul, the immaterial, the rational soul. Um, in the case of the antinomies, it was looking for... Um, kind of connection that everything has to the object as external to it. There would be an there would be an unconditioned explanation of it. And that turns out to be the world as a whole, right? Like the whole of everything external to a given object. In the case of um so like in those two cases, in the case of the paralogisms, we're looking for something that looks like a substance, right? And that's what we conclude it is. The soul is substance is one of the conclusions is that actually the first conclusion of the paralogisms. Um, in the case of the antinomy, we're looking for something that's like um, a series of substances conditioning each other or something like that. Um, so in both of those cases, what we're, we're looking for, in the first case, we're definitely looking for a thing, a subject of predicates that's going to explain everything. In the second one, we're looking for like a kind of totality of things, all the things in the world put together. You can think of that as one big thing, but although that's already part of the illusion, right? We can't really conceive of it as one big thing. In the case of the ideal, the explanation reasons looking for isn't really a thing at all. Right? I mean, again, we're looking for an explanation of what the actual object of experience is like in terms of here's all the ways things could be. And there's, of course, a lot more than three divisions here. There's infinitely many divisions or something, or anyway, a lot. And uh, here's all the way that things could be, but no, it isn't that they aren't any of the other ways. Therefore, they're the way they are. That's the type of explanation we're looking for. So, um, like, this totality of all possibilities 
isn't itself a thing. It's not even a totality of actual things the way the world is supposed to be. It's a totality of possible things, right? It's like all possible things taken as possible manifestations of the same underlying possibility. Um, so, I mean, even Here's, so here's a second case, like, so what I said is, like, um, the transcendent illusion maybe nevertheless is already on the scene here, right? That, like, even just to say the way things actually are is one of the um, indefinitely many possible ways things could be, and the reason things are this way is that they aren't any of the other ways, is already a mistake, because that sum of all possibilities is itself transcendent, right? And it's not a transcendent thing, but it's a sum of possibilities that we can't represent. Um, because, you know, we can only represent possibility using the category of possibility with its schema. Um, and that yields the um, first postulate of empirical thought in general, which is um, that is possible, which is in accord with the form of experience, both with respect to intuition and with respect to concepts. So that tells us that our concept of possibility is the concept of a possible experience, not of a possible thing in general. So it's already a mistake to think of the you know, all possible ways things could be or something like that. Um, however, uh, um, um, so, I mean, so, so far, like, so far, we're not talking about theology as we promised we would be in this part. Right? I mean, uh, um, we're just talking about the sum of all possible things. Most possible things are not actual. So like, we're not talking about a great, big, perfect, actual thing. We're talking about the actual things considered along with all the possible other ways they could be. Um, so that's already a transcendent way of applying applying the categories, specifically the the category of possibility, right? But it's not um, it's not thinking of a transcendent being. So um, um, a further step is necessary to think of this idea of reason that we now have, that is the idea of the complete disjunctive explanation of all empirical judgments, um, as the idea of some, whose object is some at least possible individual thing. Um, and yet that's exactly how Kant defines the term ideal. Right. So like at the beginning of the section, he says that um, an ideal is um, in some sense even worse than an idea. It's even farther from experience than an idea. I, I mean, I'm not sure. That makes it sound like ideas are one thing and, and I, ideals are something else as opposed to that ideals are a kind of idea. I, I mean, I'm not sure it makes a difference how we think about it, but in any case, like you could say uh, an ideal happens when from an idea, we try to extract 
a representation of a single individual. Um, so um, how does that come about in this case? And um, this is really important to understand how the transcendental illusion here becomes connected to theology. So the, you know, so to begin with, we could think of the sum of all possibilities as just a list of all the concepts that might possibly apply to things. Some of these are concepts that we actually possess and they're empirical concepts or I guess we should only include empirical concepts here. I mean, you might say, well, what about mathematical concepts and pure concepts of the understanding, like the categories? But I think, you know, this is probably a case where the kind of metaphor of treating those a priori concepts as like concepts of a priori things is um, like um, gets in the way. I mean, what they really are are capabilities to form empirical concepts. So when we're thinking about possible things, we're thinking about number one, possible things that we could experience, that is objects of empirical concepts. And then once we finish all the empirical concepts, then there's all these other weird concepts that we don't have and can't have, <laughs> but they're possible. Like some other intellect could have them or something like that. And then like, um, and I mean, I guess in between, you should also put the empirical concepts that we don't have yet, but that we might have someday, right? So like this list will include all those empirical concepts and then all those non-empirical concepts, which I drew as weird squiggles. And then, but still the same comma. And, you know, then once you add it all up, you have the sum of all possibilities. Now, obviously, when you look at that list, you don't have the concept of a single individual, right? I mean, you know, like you have every possible concept there. They conflict with each other. They, right, they couldn't all describe the same thing. Um, so, uh, so, so far, it seems like we're very far from having an ideal here. But the first step is to say, well, actually, I mean, there's just, there's two parts to the first step, one of which Kant emphasizes more than the other, although he mentions them both. So um, what we do in the first step here is, first of all, to take apart all those concepts into their like simplest components, basically. I'm not even sure that that isn't also an error, according to Kant. Inclined to think it is actually that according to Kant, empirical concepts don't have simplest components, right? That like what Locke calls us a, a simple idea is not part of how we cognize things according to Kant. But be that as it may, I mean, so right, like we think of each of these concepts, remember, like thinking of a concept as a list of characteristics that everything that falls under the concept must share. So we just take all these characteristics out and list all the characteristics. Um, and then we do one other thing. So now we have a list of characteristics. And you can put these together to make concepts, right? So like if this one is, if A is yellow and B is heavy and C is, uh, you know, gray, then you can put A and B together and you're on your way to your concept of gold. Or you can put B and C together and then you're on your way to the concept of lead or some, right? Like the, these are the, the characteristics you're gonna make all your concepts out of. And then the, the second thing you do is you say, well, to, maybe I should draw it this way. To each of these characteristics corresponds another characteristic, which is the not having that characteristic, right? So yellow, not yellow, heavy, not heavy, gray, not gray, etc. Now, I mean, 
if you don't put the list right, you're going to end up with some things that are actually positive on this side and that are actually absences of something positive on this side, right? So like if you put dark here, then you would get not dark here. But really dark is the ab absence of something, namely lightness, right? So uh, like you really should have put light on this side and not light here. Not light means dark, right? So, um, so, but suppose we have it all lined up right. So we have a list of all positive characteristics that something could have here. And then we have a list of the absence of each of those characteristics. And this is a way of representing the sum of all possibilities. I mean, that is, it would be if we could do all these steps, right? So if we actually knew a list of all the characteristics that could go into any concept, remember, meaning not only empirical concepts, although that's already too much, right? Like, we don't know what characteristics could make up empirical concepts. We don't know a priori. We have to wait for experience to find out what characteristics objects of experience have. And like... We're never sure we have the complete list, but um, but moreover, we, we need more than that to make this work, right? We need to put all possible characteristics, even of things that aren't objects of empirical concepts, but of other kinds of concepts that we don't have. Get, them, get all the positive ones on this side of the list and the absence of all of them on this side of the list. And then if you want the complete determination of any given thing, you just go down the list and choose one in each row. Exactly one, right? So you say it's it's like 20 questions, only instead of 20 questions, it's infinitely many questions. <laughs> and if you answer the infinitely many questions, then you know what the thing I'm thinking of is, right? So like, you know, is it yellow? No. Is it heavy? Yes. Is it gray? Yes. Is it right? And you go down the whole list. And the um, the idea here is that once you finish the whole infinite list, you'll have a list of everything that could possibly be true of something. And you've said, like, for each of those things, whether it's true of what you're thinking of or not. I mean, of course. There isn't really someone here who's thinking, right? We're not really playing a game of 20 questions, but I think that's a useful way of, of like understanding what's going on here, right? Like imagine one side knows what the thing is and the other side's trying to find out. So the other side can find out exactly what it is by going down this whole list. And the thinking is, why must that be enough to say what it is? Well, I mean, because if it's not that, it must be different from it in some way. Right. So something must like if I'm thinking of Q and you go down this whole list and your guess is Q prime and Q prime is not the same thing as Q, then there must be something that's true of Q that's not true of Q prime. Like let's say Q is X and Q prime is not X. Well, but then that means you left X off the list, right? X should have been on the list. So there wasn't a complete list after all. So if you really had a complete list, then you would have to guess correctly at the end. The individual object that I have in mind. Okay, so far so good. The next step is we say, well, um, this is kind of redundant as a, as a description of all possibility. Right, I mean, we don't really need this column. Really, the sum of all possibility is the sum of all po possible characteristics that something could have. Right? And now we think of the 
20 questions game as working not by choosing one in each row, but just as going down and so to speak, like picking out the ones that we want and leaving the others there. Um, so this is an important step because before when we had all the contradictory opposites in here, it was still clear that all of this doesn't add up to the concept of anything, right? Because on the contrary, this is like, if you add all this up, you get a you get an infinite contradiction. It's A and not A, it's B and not B, it's C and not C, et cetera. But now when we think of the sum of all possibilities this way, um, when you look at it, it looks like, the sum of all possibilities is the set is itself the concept of a thing. And moreover, so it's not the concept of a thing we could experience, right? Because as I said, some of these are characteristics are the ones that are inside our actual empirical concepts, but most of them are not. So if you add up all these characteristics, you don't get the concept of an object we could experience. But it seems like you do get the concept of some object because after all, like this is a way that you could play the game, right? Like, um, you know, um, I like suppose I'm like supernatural, right? And I have, I can have the idea of um, non-empirical objects in mind and uh, you're playing the game. And every time you ask me, you know, should we keep A, should we keep B, should we keep C, da, 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 I always say yes. So when we get to the end of the list, I've said yes to all of them and we have, that's one of the outcomes of the game. So that's the concept of a possible thing. Now, I mean, um, and moreover, it seems like, um, and, and this is another point where the, where you might think this is where the illusion starts. <laughs> it seems like even though we don't have an empirical concept of that thing, we do have a representation of it in a sense, because, um, you know, in general, things with non-empirical characteristics, um, like uh, this way of looking at it isn't gonna help me understand what they are because, you know, um, I'm gonna know that you, you, you're gonna know that I would say yes for some, pre some uh, characteristics that you have no idea what they are, but that doesn't help you tell, that doesn't help you know what thing I'm thinking of because you don't know what they are, right? So like, so in the end, like a list of how to reply to all of these things, if the answer, if the thing I have in mind is not empirical is not gonna help you. It's like, you're only gonna be able to determine the thing if I say yes to some empirical characteristics, then you're gonna be able to tell which empirical thing I'm thinking of. But in the case of this, in this special case, where you know the rule is just that I say yes to everything. So in that sense, you kind of, you do have a representation, at least if we assume, and again, this probably was already the mistake, right? But if we assume that you understand that you have a representation of the sum of all possibility, 
now, like when you know that I say yes to everything without knowing in detail what everything is, you know what I'm thinking of. Because it's the one thing that contains the sum of all possibilities, so to speak. And you do know what that is, supposedly. Why do you supposedly know what, what that is? Be again, I think that this is part of the illusion. You supposedly know what that is because reason demanded that the understanding think such a sum of all possibility under the influence of the transcendental illusion. And so the understanding said, well, okay, here's how I use my category of possibility, but it doesn't really know what it's doing, <laughs> right? So, um, so we assume that we know what the sum of all possibility is, but we really don't. But if we did know what the sum of all possibility was, then you would know what thing I was talking about, even though you wouldn't know all of those infinitely many characteristics, because you can specify the rule I'm following. Just say yes to everything, to everything possible. And you know what everything possible means, even though you don't know the individual things that are possible. Um, Now, I mean, there's well, so, and I guess I'll say right here, so this is where we get to something like theology, because this thing I'm thinking of has all the positive characteristics and no negative characteristics. So it has more thingness or reality than any other thing. Right? Like to have some characteristics is to be a thing. Um, uh, remember that under the category of quality, what corresponds to affirmative judgment is the category of or moment of reality that is thingness. I've probably said this before, but say it again, because even if I said it before, I probably forgot, right? Race is the word for thing in Latin. And realitas or reality comes from race. So it means thingness. So something that had every possible of which every possible real affirmation was true, it has every positive characteristic, would be the realest possible being, the most thing-like possible being. And this is why Kant calls it the ens rea, yeah, realissimum. Okay, this is just the superlative in Latin, right? So it means the realist, this means being, right? The realist being, sorry, not realist, realist. The, the realist being, the most real being, which means the most, Most thing, <laughs> right? It's it's the being that is more a thing than any other thing. And that sounds like a possible definition of God. That then which nothing greater is possible is uh uh, it's Anselm's definition of God that used in the ontological proof we'll talk about next week. You might think that this was a good way of representing that than which nothing greater is possible because like you add up all these characteristics, um, there's no other po positive characteristics left. So nothing could be better. And this is an ideal because since it's a complete answer to the 20 questions or that is infinite questions came, it's the description of exactly one thing. Now, I mean,
it seems clear that, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say clear. It seems that several other mistakes have worked their way in here that aren't necessarily part of the transcendental illusion itself. Um, actually, there are mistakes that um, um, Kant describes Leibniz as making in the Amphiboly. And remember, at least as far as I could tell, the mistake that's made in the Amphiboly is not the same as the transcendental illusion that's discussed in the dialectic. The Amphiboly, remember, is an appendix to the third part of the analytic. It's not part of the dialectic. And Kant actually seems to say there that the illusion, even though at some point he calls it an overwhelming illusion that's hard to resist, but you might even call it a natural illusion at some point, but I feel like Kant, but at it, it, some places Kant also seems to say that no, the illusion or the mistake that happens in, well, in, in the body of phenomena and noumena, and then the somewhat different mistake that happens in the amphiboly, that these are like special philosophical mistakes. They're not natural tendencies of human reason. Right, so it's like a mistake that an ingenious philosopher like Leibniz would talk himself into, basically, but not a mistake that's kind of like natural to the common understanding. Um, so what other mistakes am I talking about here? Well, one other mistake is um, thinking that positive characteristics can't contradict each other. That was the mistake that this Kant discussed in the Amphiboly under the concepts of agreement and opposition corresponding to the category of quality. Um, uh, right, and he said that um, it seemed to Leibniz that a principle like that must hold. And by the way, so one of the main places that Leibniz appeals to that principle is in his proof of the existence of God. So it's not surprising that we find it working its way in as we make the transition to the ideal as theology, right? So, I mean, so the, like the principle is that positive characteristics can't oppose each other, that the only things that can oppose each other are positive characteristics and their absence um right and Kant says that although if we like try to apply the concepts of agreement and opposition to things in general we'll find um that we can't understand opposition except as the way concepts can oppose each other and concepts can oppose each other only because one says you know the object has this characteristics and the other says the object doesn't have that same characteristic. Um, Kant says, although that all would be true if we could apply agreement and opposition to things in general, uh, the, for the object of experience, it's not true because the, you know, the form of external sense space provides a way that positive characteristics can cancel each other out because of the, the, the um, kind of order it gives to direction. So they can be moving forces in opposite directions and both of them can be positive characteristics, right? There really is a force in this direction and there really is a force in this direction, but they add up to zero. So that says, first of all, that when we go down the, if we could, if we really could divide all of characteristics into um, like um, real characteristics and absences or negations of real characteristics, if we really could do that, we still wouldn't be sure that picking the positive in each case, we were getting the possible description of a thing because some of these, although they can't contradict each other, will oppose each other and cancel each other out. Um, so 
that's one problem. Another problem is the one that Kant discusses under the heading of identity and difference in the amphiboly, um, which that is corresponding to the category of quantity. And that is is Leibniz's principle of the identity of indiscernibles, right? So remember when I said, like, if Q is different, is not the same as Q prime, then there must be something, some characteristic that Q has that Q prime doesn't. And that should be on the list. And that's the identity of indiscernibles, right? Like if I can't give you a characteristic that makes one different from the other, then they're the same thing. So after you an after I answer all infinitely many uh, questions, you know exactly which individual thing I'm thinking of. That would be true if the identity of indiscernibles were true. But again, Kant says for the object of experience, the identity of indiscernibles doesn't hold. Why? Because there can be two things that have exactly the same characteristics, but they're just in different places at the same time. So the whole thought that this is the way of determining an individual is already involves some kind of mistake. Um, So like my sense is that the, but again, I'm not sure of this, that what we've gone through so far is first of all, the transcendental illusion itself, which just results in thinking that we must be able to compare every object of experience to the sum of all possibilities. And then a series of further like philosophical, basically like Leibnizian errors that lead from that to the conclusion that um, we must be able to compare each object of experience to the single most perfect possible thing. Um, I guess I should say there's another issue here, which I think I don't have time to get into, although Kant does talk about it. Um, oh no, I didn't write down the page of this, so I'll never find it now. When he talks about it, he says, the su supreme reality must condition the possibility of all things as their ground, not as their sum. This is although in our first rough outline we may we represented it so or something like that. So I mean the problem roughly speaking is this like if if these are really like if some of these are empirical characteristics like yellow and heavy and whatever. I mean we don't want to say the most perfect possible thing is yellow and heavy and um um and you know, has the biggest possible fingers, and you know, like <laughs> um, that is a list of all characteristics doesn't seem right for specifying the most perfect possible being. It seems like the most perfect possible being would be um, simple, unchanging, right? And like if we actually went down the list of categories, which this is another thing about the ideal that Kant doesn't ever do this. If we went down the list of categories and said which ones apply to it in an unconditioned way, we would say things like it's absolutely one, it's absolutely simple, it's absolutely eternal. Um, and that's not really consistent with having sensible characteristics like yellow and heavy. Um, uh, so, uh, um, so the solution, but this already shows that something weird has happened here, 
And there's a moment like this in the third meditation too in Descartes, where we say, oh, we didn't actually mean it has all these characteristics. We mean it's like the ground of all these possible characteristics. Okay, I'm not going to say anything more about that than, than just that, because the last thing I want to say is um, um, what needs to be said to lead into the proofs, the alleged proofs of the existence of God in the next lecture, in the last lecture of the course. Um, I, I guess I should say, you know, I, I want to emphasize Kant thinks none of these proofs work. He does have his own kind of proof of the existence of God from, from an ethical, practic, practical, that is ethical point of view. Um, it works in a completely different way and it, it has a completely different kind of conclusion. So, but these theoretical proofs of the existence of God, Kant thinks there's three possible ones and none of them work. So, but, um, but like, just generally speaking, how do we get from this demand that we'd be able to conceive the sum of all possibilities to, um, which now true, we've now like switched that or transformed it into, we can conceive the most perfectly real possible thing. And we compare it to the object of experience to explain it. How do we get from that to saying, oh, and by the way, that most perfect possible thing exists? Because like we're not, the kind of explanation we're looking for is not the kind we looked at in the antinomies, right? It's not cause and effect, for example. If you explain everything as the effects of an unconditioned cause, then of course the unconditioned cause must exist to have those effects. But if you explain everything as the alternatives that are possible on the ground of the sum of all possibilities, the sum of all possibilities doesn't have to exist. Even if we've made out a way that it, we can conceive of it existing as an individual thing. So it seems like here another mistake comes in. And it seems like the mistake comes from the fourth antinomy. So it's like, so in this case, it's not one of Leibniz's mistakes, but it's a, something that comes from another part of the transcendental dialectic and kind of like interferes in our business here. So this is on B611. Um, I'm going to, yes, I'm out of time here, but I'm going to go a little bit over because I was interrupted in the middle and there's no one here anyway. So, yeah, there we go. It's on page 495 in the translation. Notwithstanding this pressing need of reason to presuppose something that may afford the understanding a sufficient foundation for the complete determination of its concepts, it is yet much too easily conscious of the ideal and merely fictitious character of such a presupposition to allow itself on this ground alone to be persuaded that a mere creature of its own thought is a real being. Right? Again, like what the understanding needs here is only to be able to conceive of the most perfect po possible being and think of everything else as a kind of limitation of that or limitation of its effects. So, so nothing here so far would persuade reason to think that this perfect, most this ens realissimum that it's now thinks it has a concept of actually exists. Were it not that, it is impelled from another direction to seek a resting place in the regress from the conditioned, which is given to the unconditioned. So that's talking about the antinomy. Right, the antinomy is about the regress from the conditioned to the unconditioned. Um, um, and uh, I'm not going to read more of the text, which if I read more of it, it would make this clearer, I think. But 
um, specific branch of the antinomy that's involved here is the fourth antinomy, the antinomy of contingence and necessity. And so basically, like in the fourth antinomy, the thesis is that there exists an unconditionally necessary being. Something that's necessary, not on the condition of anything else, but just necessary, necessarily exists. And what Kant says is that the ens realissimum that reason has arrived at in order to try to, to satisfy the demands in the ideal, it then turns around and says, oh, by the way, the thesis of the fourth antinomy says I should be thinking of an unconditionally necessary being. What could be an unconditionally necessary being? And Kant says, the answer is we have no idea. Anything could be an unconditionally necessary being for all we know, because we don't have any way to apply the concept of necessity to, in a case like that. But if we did have a concept of the most perfect possible being, then Kant says it would be the kind of thing that it's clear from its concept could be unconditionally necessary. Because, as he puts it, it contains the wherefore for every therefore. That is, like, um, if you think of the conditions that are necessary for something to exist as being somewhere on that list of characteristics, I guess you would say, then this one already has all of them. So there's no room left out over outside it for something else to condition it. So by this indirect route, Kant says, we arrive at the idea that, or the, I shouldn't say idea, we, we arrive at the conclusion that um, the absolutely necessary being that the thesis of the fourth antinomy is looking for must be the same as this ens realissimum. And the thesis of the fourth antinomy says an unconditionally necessary being exists, because again, that kind of explanation requires that the unconditionally explaining object actually exists. So we so we say, so that's how we reach the conclusion that this ens realissimum actually exists and is not only the ground of possibility of all objects, but is also their unconditioned condition of existence and cause. And so at that point, we've proved the existence of God. So we'll, I'll talk uh, next time in detail about how Kant thinks the different ways of going from this point, how they work out, and why none of them work. Okay, I will see some of you then, I hope. Bye.